Okay. I love this silence that falls over the room, the power of professing. Although today you're not here for me, so that's fine. Uh, welcome to the Franklin Pierce Center for IP again. And for those of you who have been here for other events, including the one last week that led us off with a, essentially a technical introduction to some of the issues that our speaker is going to talk about today. Welcome to part two of our SOPA PIPA series. We are very, very honored and privileged to have Professor Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University with us. He is the director there also of their High Tech Law Institute that does a lot of pretty amazing conferences and things. Um, he, I'm privileged to count him as a friend, and he's also a friend of some of our professors, like Professor Fusco right here. And let me just take the opportunity to thank all of you, as well as my colleagues, for coming. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time telling you what Eric's going to talk about, because I think I'd leave those surprises to him. I think one of the things that he would like to have is a discussion. And so I encourage all of you, because I know from having had you in my classes, that a number of you have some really interesting questions. So please feel free to ask Eric those questions, um, either during or after his talk. And without further ado, help me welcome Professor Eric Goldman. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming today. I'm really grateful for uh, you uh, taking time out of your schedule. Um, I am especially grateful to Professor Wong and Professor Fusco for helping me get here. Um, this is my first time in New Hampshire, and uh, I'm soaking in all the local atmosphere, so it's been a real pleasure. Um, let's just start with a little uh, audience analysis. Uh, prior to last week's visit, um, how many of you had heard of SOPA? Hands up, please. Okay, hold on. Keep those hands up. Now, um, how many of you understood SOPA prior to last week? Okay, so we're going to try and demystify some of why the hands are up. Now, one more set of hands, which is how many of you participated in the protests on January 18th? Um, I, maybe we have a good uh, overlap with the people who actually think they understood it. Um, but uh, we had a lot of people participating in the protests, um, but not entirely sure what they were protesting about. So well, here's what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened on January 18th, um, which was really a remarkable day in internet law, and I would argue much broadly, more broadly than that, uh, in, our, uh, in our form of Republican government. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the legislation proposed to do and how it was uh, uh, its basic architecture. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what's happened since January 18th and why these battles are still ongoing and where they're taking place. So let's start with just an overview of what happened on uh, January 18th. Um, January 18th um, uh, was a remarkable day because people were buzzing about a, uh, 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 a legislative proposal that, as I said, many people don't understand, but was clearly um, uh, uh, resonating throughout the entire internet. So if you went to this site, and I'm guessing most of you recognize the site despite the fact that it was blacked out, um, you didn't get your normal interface. Uh, this, of course, being Google. Uh, Google blacked out its site. Now, they didn't really black it out. They just turned off the um, uh, logo, and they said, tell Congress, please don't censor the web. Anyone in favor of censoring the web in the room? Um, kind of thing that uh, was uh, perhaps a little bit rhetoric, um, but clearly a high stakes thing. I don't know what you guys value, but um, I don't want the internet uh, censored. Um, this one might have had even more impact. Um, this was Wikipedia on January 18th. Imagine a world without free knowledge. The US Congress is considering legislation that could fatally damage the free and open internet. Anyone in favor of fatally damaging the free and open internet? My guess is no, another thing that we would take for granted. Now, unlike Google, which still worked fine, Wikipedia literally shut down their entire site. That's something that we all notice. I don't know how many times a day you go into Wikipedia. I'm into Wikipedia uh, multiple times a day. And so um, having uh, the site uh, literally turned off, one of the top 10 websites in the world, is something that we notice. But what really caught my attention is things like how the Hollywood insiders felt about the law. So for example, we have this. We must stop SOPA PIPA to keep the web open and free, says Kim Kardashian, with her 14 million Twitter followers. Now, I ask you, perhaps we could leave it rhetorical, which is going to change more people's behavior? 
shutting down Wikipedia or a tweet from Kim Kardashian? I see that as a fair fight. So everyone on January 18th is talking about this legislation. People from the technology community, people from uh, uh, the uh, free and open internet, to Kim Kardashian, a Hollywood insider, saying, uh, there's a problem, you need to check it out. Um, and the overall collective drumbeat of these efforts led to something that is truly remarkable in any uh, political circle here in the United States. But certainly when it comes to technology law, what we saw was amazing. So on January 18th, we had 19 senators who came out and opposed PIPA, which is one of the two laws that was in uh, debate then. In one day, they all said, we oppose it. Uh, now, in a number of these cases, you'll notice these are the starred ones. These are people who had co-sponsored the laws. They flipped. They did a 180. On a single day, we had all these people come out and either change their position or newly articulate saying, we are opposed to this law. Now, you'll see some, uh, some partisan politics here. You'll notice that 16 of the 19 uh, were um, uh, Republicans. So some of what happened on the day is that the Republicans thought, you know what, we think we can uh, box in the Democrats here. We're going to position ourselves as champions of the internet. The Democrats are the fat cat uh, um, uh, politicos. Uh, and so there was some of that going on, no question about that. But to have 19 senators, so we only have 100 of them in our country, remember? I mean, this is a large chunk of our governing body came out and said, we are opposed to this law. And if we have to, we are going to eat our words. So we had something very powerful and very high stakes going on here. But let's see if we can figure out why there was so much activity, so much high profile attention paid to this law. And I, um, I break a number of rules in my presentations. And the next slide, I'm going to break one of the rules of PowerPoint because I'm going to spend uh, 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 maybe 15 minutes on the next slide. As you know, you're supposed to, if you do the Larry Lessig model, you're supposed to do about six slides a minute, uh, maybe more. Um, but certainly spending 15 minutes on one, a little long. Um, but we have a lot to say, and I'm going to do graphically depict for you um, uh, what was at stake here. Um, so the real battle over SOPA and PIPA was about deputizing intermediaries to do enforcement work for IP owners. SOPA and PIPA covered not only copyright, it also covered trademark. And the model I'm going to show you works fine for trademark as well. But we're going to focus on the copyright side of things. And so the idea is that there's, we're going to find that there's uh, uh, bad actors out there. And then we're going to take a look at how we try and channel or manage those bad actors. Um, let's take a look and start with uh, uh, the bad actor. And the copyright analysis, that the paradigmatic bad actor in online copyright infringement is the person who uploads a file that is infringing that they don't have permission to share. Uh, some in the room may be this person. So we're not talking about some hypothetical uh, uh, bandit wearing the ski mask going around and doing bad things. We might be talking about you, but still, in the, the grand scheme of things, the model of online copyright enforcement, we're going to say the uploader is a bad person. This person is taking a work they don't have the right to share, and they're making it available for others to enjoy. Now, it's possible that still that person may not be the bad actor, even if they don't have the rights to share that work. It is, in theory, possible that they would have things like a fair use defense. They may, in fact, have other authorization. And as you may know, there may be situ circumstances where the uh, copyright owner may not object to that activity, even if they've never given permission. They may view that as a form of evangelizing or marketing the work that they're willing to uh, acquiesce to, even if um, they've never consented to it. But we're going we're gonna to ignore all the defenses and all the other things. We're going to say, that's a bad actor. This is a person who's doing things that we as a society don't want. Now, in addition, we have another uh, group of people. These are the people who download that file. So these are the people who are obtaining this infringing work um, over the internet. Now, these people might also be bad actors. I know there are people in the room who fit into this bucket. Um, but uh, these people may have better defenses. We might feel more confident these people have a um, fair use defense. Or though there is no uh, doctrine of innocent infringement in copyright that excuses the infringing activity, we might look at these people as the innocents in the system. They may not be able to know or tell that a work is infringing. They might be the innocent bystander to the bad actions caused by the uploader. Copyright law some might, might still punish them, but we might not feel that they're the bad guys. We might say the uploader is really the bad guy in that circumstance, not the downloader. 
But for our purposes, let's assume for a moment that both of these people are the bad guys, that the uploader is deliberately uploading the file to try and um, uh, disseminate work without permission, and the downloaders are, are downloading it because they want to get something for free when they know they ought to be paying. So let's just treat the, both of these folks as the bad guy, though it is more colorable. Now, as I mentioned, the laws evolve both uh, trademark as well as copyright. So if you wanted to, you could say, assume the uploader is the person who's trying to sell counterfeit goods or online, and the downloader is the buyer of the counterfeit goods. The model would actually apply identically. OK, let's assume for a moment that these are the bad guys. Now, in order for these people to communicate with each other over the internet, they're probably going to use an intermediary. In fact, they will probably use several. But uh, for our purposes here, we're going to focus on one group of intermediaries, either the web hosts or the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service that they uh, use. Um, so uh, let's talk about the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service for a moment. Uh, this would be a service that would allow these people to find each other, but then they would uh, share the files directly uh, with each other. Um, and as a legal conclusion. I can't give you the doctrine to support it, but as a legal conclusion, let's assume that we're going to throw the P2P file sharing software providers under the bus. They don't control the activity of the uploader or downloader. In many cases, all they do is provide some software and say, let her rip. And yet, we're still going to just assume as a matter of legal conclusion that the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service is a bad guy as well. Um, and that's the way the case law has treated them. We have copyright law, and then we have peer-to-peer -peer file sharing copyright law. And I can't make the two reconcile with each other. So um, the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service is a little bit of an unusual circumstance. And so we're going to put that one to the side and assume those guys are bad guys as well. Um, but the web host could be a bad guy or could be someone that's actually doing things that we might want. So a paradigmatic web host might be someone like, say, YouTube. I trust everyone in the room has used YouTube. In that circumstance here, you've got someone who has uploaded videos to YouTube. You've got someone who's downloaded them. And then you've got YouTube in the middle mediating that conversation between the two parties. Now, we've already addressed the legal um, um, uh, obligations of YouTube in 1998. This was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act Online Safe Harbors codified in 17 U.S.C. 512. Um, and in particular, 512C set up a notice and takedown regime. What we expect web hosts to do is that we expect them to respond when they're notified that there's a copyright infringement taking place on their service. But we also expect copyright owners to notify web hosts to tell them that there's something going wrong on their service. And in the main, we'll take the position that if the copyright owners don't notify the web hosts, then even though there's infringement activity taking place that's being mediated by the web host, they're not responsible for it. So we've set up a regime that puts the burdens on both the copyright owner and the web host. But in that order, copyright owner must, uh, must communicate, then web host must take action, but only after it's received the notice. When I've given this talk or variations of this talk, I found that many people thought that Soap and Pippa was the battle over these folks, this box in the chain. It was trying to adjust what the web host was obligated to do. And that wasn't actually addressed specifically at all. What we're going to see is it was the battle was being moved elsewhere, which would moot and make irrelevant the 512 scheme because it was a less powerful tool than the tools that were being offered to copyright owners. Um, but we weren't actually debating about the web host liability at all. This was off the table. We were fighting about other things because we've already resolved that in the 1998, and that law has been working for the last 14 years. We could debate its efficacy. I will take the position that though it has got some serious deficiencies, which we can explore in the Q&A if you want, um, that, uh, that the DMCA Online Safe Harbors have uh, established enough equilibrium that has allowed the user-generated content community to develop. We may not have a YouTube without the DMCA Online Safe Harbors, but we do have YouTube. And we have other people in that category that are enabled because they can rely upon the fact that they are not obligated to take action until they receive that notice. OK. Uh, I don't know how many minutes I'm into my talk now. Let's talk about SOPA and PIPA. <laughs> Let's talk about what the law is supposed to do. Let's start by saying that there is a lot of people that help these people in the middle help this conversation to take place. If you want, we can talk about these are the bad guys, these are the people who support the bad guys, and these are the people who support the people who support the bad guys. And we're going to spend our time talking about this column and what we expect from people in this 
column, the supporters of the supporters of the bad guys. Now, let's just take a quick look at some of the different categories of things we have here. We have the people who invest in web hosts or P2P file sharing services. Now, normally, as a matter of corporate law, we say these people shouldn't be liable for anything uh, more than lo potentially losing their investment, right? We have uh, the doctrines of corporate uh, veils that uh, insulate um, uh, investors from liability for the, the actions of the corporation. Um, th we shouldn't be talking about those people, but corporate owners have sued investors repeatedly, and we are still developing the law that applies to investors um, it, they are not off the list of potential defendants by copyright owners when they're chasing the bad guys. Remember, they are the investors and the supporters of the bad guys. They're two steps away. Copyright owners don't view them as off limits. Um, we can also go after other types of consultants or uh, service providers to uh, these uh, supporters. So um, I'm going to cross over to trademark for just a moment. Let me give you an example from the trademark context. We had a person who was selling counterfeit goods or allegedly counterfeit goods uh, to buyers um, and uh, via a website, and they hired a company that helped them optimize the website for search engine placement. So they were trying to help the website show up better in the search engine results. Now, they weren't running the website. They weren't selling the goods. All they were doing was helping with some of the marketing. And the trademark owner sued and won against the supporter to the supporter of the bad guy. Um, let's skip down to, uh, below, uh, to the bottom two for a moment. Um, so we could talk about uh, people like landlords. It's not possible to run these businesses without having some real estate where these uh, companies are located, where the employees are housed. We could say, as a matter of law, those landlords are on the hook. They are responsible for what their tenants are doing in, uh, in the activity. And we don't say that in the, law, in the main. We generally say, at least as a matter of copyright law, that landlords aren't responsible for the actions of their tenants. Um, though they are a critical but-for factor in the operation of that business, we still say, you know what, that goes too far. We're not going to um, put them on the hook. We could similarly put people like the phone company or the power company on the, on the uh, potential defendant list. We could say, again, those companies cannot operate without um, uh, phone or power, uh, but, uh, but generally, again, we don't do that. And these are utilities. They may not even have any discretion about who they serve. Um, but we've drawn a line and said, you know what, that's too far. Those people are, though they might be but for causal, uh, causal agents, um, they're still not responsible for the actions of these uh, support uh, providers. Um, SOPA and PIPA focused on this middle five group of people, people who provide internet access to the support providers, um, people who operate directories or search engines where the support providers might be listed, uh, domain name registrars, uh, ad networks uh, that provide advertising uh, services, or payment systems that would provide things like credit card services. And what SOPA and PIPA was all about was deputizing those five groups of people to police these people to make them police the bad guys. So it was the two steps removed that really got people's attention because it had the potential to break the internet. And we could go one step further. We could say all of these people have investors and consultants, landlords, power uh, and phone companies, and they might also have people who provide them things like internet access. And there's no reason not to keep just extending this chain out more columns to the right to where it all ends up where everyone in this room is ultimately likely a defendant. You're doing something that provides some support to someone who's providing support all the way down the chain to a person who's engaged in the bad guys, uh, to, to the people who are the bad guys. Um, so at some point, you start to say, where does it stop? Where does the, um, uh, the uh, effort to find uh, the people who can control the bad guys stop? And um, for many people, we realized going to this column is troubling. And maybe this is where it should stop. We should not go so far as to think about the obligations of the people in the red box. Now, these people all could do things that would help cut off infringing activity. So for example, um, you, if you turn off the internet, that's going to cut off activity. If you uh, de-index de people from the search engines, well, it's going to be harder for people to find them. Um, if you turn off a domain name, the website won't resolve. If you turn off the ad networks and the payment systems, uh, then you can cut off the flow of money. So the idea behind uh, the laws was to say, let's find these critical support providers and turn them into the copyright police. They will be deputized to take action to stop the activity that's downstream from them. Now, one of the biggest problems with doing so, and there are a number of very significant problems, is that these people don't have the same incentive to 
um, uh, uh, worry about uh, the legitimacy of the activity downstream from them. If you are an ad network, for example, and you're providing ads to a two potato site, uh, a small potato site that um, is uh, 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 not generating a lot of money, and a copyright owner sends you a notice and says, cut off your ads to this site. Well, what you're going to do is you're just going to cut off the ads to the site, right? You're not going to do any investigation. You're not going to do any um, research. You're going to say, you know what? I'm not making a lot of money from these people. I don't need to worry about it. Off they go. And so when, the, uh, when you do that with people like the internet access providers or the registrars or and if for companies that were uh, dependent on credit card systems, if you do it with payment systems, when those people turn off service, they take down the entire website. Right? In other words, that site literally goes down because of whatever activity the copyright owner has complained about. So they ha don't have the, 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 um, uh, the incentives to stand behind their customers in many cases, and they have a binary system. They can turn off the website or they can leave it on. Now notice when you go back to the web hosts here, the DMCA Online Safe Harbor uh, requires a web host to take down individual items of content and only in limited cases does it require uh, them to actually turn off or kick uh, out a particular user. So these people have much more granular um, controls over the infringing activity. They can look for just infringing activity and turn it off. These people don't have any granular controls. If they stop providing service, that's it. It's a binary kind of thing. And so um, what uh, the, the battles and symbols and people were doing was actually deputizing a bunch of people who had no incentive to stand behind their customers and who had very weak controls over their customers' activity. And so as a result, we knew what was going to happen is that they were going to be t aggressively responding to any request to turn off um, uh, service, and that was going to affect websites if, even if those websites had uh, a non-trivial amount of legitimate activity. So, um, <clears throat> okay. The legislation I'm going to take a position is dead. So we are no longer discussing um, putting the statutory duties of uh, having some kind of way of uh, obligating them to turn off or cut off um, uh, the support providers to the bad guys. Um, so the people in the box uh, in red uh, are not currently subject to uh, pressures of that litigation, uh, legislation. I'm now going to explain how the battle is going to continue, and I'm going to make my case to you that we are going to deputize all the people in the red box anyway. Let me show you how we get there. Okay. Let's talk about all the places that the battle moved once uh, the copyright owners suffered a uh, defeat uh, um, uh, in uh, the legislation. And I can't stress how big that defeat was. The copyright owners were the, the uh, heavyweight champions, undefeated. You guys have seen this movie, right? And then you've got the internet users crying out. They're the, the, the scrappy underdog, the one who's pounding uh, frozen sides of beef in a, in a refrigerator. And the underdog won. Well, what do you think the heavyweight champion's going to do? The heavyweight champion's going to say, well, good for you. No, the heavyweight champion's in the business of slugging it out. And one of the ways they're going to slug it is they're going to look for other ways to get the same results in Congress that they weren't able to get. Some of you may be familiar with the CISPA. Uh, it's an effort to try and regulate uh, cybersecurity. Um, basically, it's a notification scheme where uh, various intermediaries online are going to be required to provide notice of uh, cybersecurity irregularities to the spooks. I don't really want the government to know what I'm doing, so the basic architecture law is deeply flawed to me. But let's put aside the merits of whether or not this is an appropriate regulation of cybersecurity. What this does is it builds an infrastructure that puts the intermediaries, the same people who are in that red box that we just discussed on the last slide on the far right column, and they're going to be the business constantly providing government bad activity on their site. The next step would likely be, why don't you also tell us about, say, copyright infringing activity or whatever else you want to do. In other words, this becomes the, uh, the infrastructure, not just to regulate cybersecurity, but to regulate whatever type of content people will find objectionable. So 
Um, what you can do is you can uh, build out uh, uh, the infrastructure that the copyright owners were seeking to build out through some other mean under another terminology, wait a few years, you piggyback on the infrastructure. There's a lot of people who are concerned. That's what's going on with debates on cybersecurity. This is actually a Trojan horse for the copyright owners to get what they couldn't get under SOPA. Okay. Um, but I think that the principal battleground has moved uh, to the executive branch as opposed to Congress. So um, certainly uh, the copyright owners are going to uh, hang out for a little while, let the, um, uh, let the dust settle. Um, but they have a lot of friends in the executive branch. So I mean, you may be familiar with the general revolving door problem in our government um, that uh, there's a pretty tight uh, um, uh, interplay between uh, the entertainment industry and the people who work in places like the Department of Justice. It's kind of a revolving door. And so what happens is uh, content owners call up their former co-workers who are now in the administration and say, hey, we got a problem. We need you to go and fix it for us. And uh, the, uh, the executive uh, branch person, the person DOJ says, yeah, when I was in practice, I would have been hopping mad about that too. Let me see what I can do for you. And don't forget, now I don't just have civil powers to go and um, enforce. I got the guys with the big guns uh, uh, backing me up here. Uh, so some of you may have seen, for example, the prosecution against Mega Upload. This is a criminal cross, a copyright prosecution against a site that was engaged in web hosting services. That's all they did. They allowed uploaders to upload files and users to download those files. Remember back to the, uh, the, the two screens ago, right? They were right in that middle bucket um, doing what any other web host would do. They allow people to upload and download. They mediate that conversation. And the U.S. government uh, came um, down on them like a ton of bricks and did all the things that we might be nervous about. They didn't just file a, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a criminal complaint um, against uh, the folks. Uh, uh, they, uh, they basically shut down the business. They seized all the assets, including the servers and the domain name, and they took all the data that was on those servers and they've locked it up. You may be familiar that this week, we're, uh, I believe it's tomorrow, we're going to have a, a hearing about the data that's locked up on these servers. In, this is not some abstract data. This is user data, people who are actually using this to talk to other people. That data has been, been seized by the government. It's in their possession. Um, uh, and uh, no one can get it. Um, this slide comes from um, uh, a representative of Paramount uh, Pictures um, who's been going around and trying to evangelize his concerns about copyright theft. And you notice it's a little bit like the notches on the bedpost type of thing, right? It's like, we already took down number one. Here's our next five targets that people were going to call um, uh, the U.S. Uh, government to go and uh, bust. Um, remember, these are our friends who we used to uh, be coworkers with. Uh, these are the next five on our target list. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> um, so we're going to see the battle go to the executive branch. That instead of um, uh, uh, the copyright owners having to go to court, they're going to go and ask the guys with the big guns to do their dirty work for them to go after people who are in the middle of the conversations, not the bad guys. Remember, these are the support providers to the bad guys. They can just go to the government and ask them to do that. We also have been having an ongoing campaign with the Department of Homeland Security's Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Now, we have friendly neighbors to our north here in New Hampshire, so we don't have as many of the green uh, uh, trucks driving around. But in California, we look at uh, our southern neighbor as the source of people we don't want. And so we have a lot of green trucks driving around with um, uh, ICE officials acting as law enforcement to keep the Mexicans out. But they don't just uh, keep the Mexicans out. They also police the borders of the internet in their green trucks. They drive around looking for things that are going wrong at the border to fix them. And so what they've done is over the last uh, 18 months or so, they've grabbed hundreds of domain names of sites that they believe are being used for illegal activity. They just grab the domain names. They don't do that with any due process. There's no notification to the websites that they're going to be grabbed. Um, they just grab them. And not only do they just grab them, but sometimes they make mistakes. And we had an example of that. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this one. This is the Daha 1 uh, uh, seizure. So Immigration and Custom Enforcement uh, seized a domain name, uh, Daha 1. Um, they held on to it for a year. At the end of the year, they said, here's your domain name back. That's all they said. They didn't say, we're sorry. They didn't say, here's 
oh, that we made a mistake. They didn't explain why they grabbed the domain in the first place. And that for that year, Dahas One was litigating against the government to try and get its domain name back, to undo this asset seizure. And there was a court proceeding that was not in the system. It wasn't on PACER. The defendant could not get access to the, the filings that the government had made with the court. The file was maintained in a clerk's desk drawer. Now, I've read novels about a government that operates that way. I'd like to think that those novels were science fiction or describing someone else, but this was our government enforcing our rights using a system that is extremely troubling. But this is the way it goes. The copyright owners are able to call up the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials. They actually, when they did the first seizure, they held it at the uh, offices of Disney. So it wasn't like this was some kind of uh, independent effort. Um, and uh, they just go and using the powers of our US government, they just grab domain names. Um, now, some of the sites that they've grabbed, in fact, might not be illegitimate at all. A number of them are what we might call linking sites. So they are sites that link to files, and they're basically like blogs. They're like, hey, I found a new file here. You should go check it out. Um, so for example, um, uh, they might be sites that say, here's, a, here's the latest hot new music in uh, the hip hop community. Um, and you can go find the actual music over here. So notice that the linking site is a site that links to a web host that is uh, providing services to a, uh, uh, to the bad guys, if they are even bad guys. Um, and so the linking sites are two steps away. They're having their assets seized, ex parte, no due process, no ability to contest it. And if they want to litigate against the government, they're like Dahas one, then good luck uh, trying to find the file to actually litigate against it. So we're back to the, uh, and I'm sorry, with the linking sites, um, in many cases, uh, the copyright owners are asking the linking sites to promote their new music. They're looking as a form of uh, evangelizing to their potential audiences. So you have a site where the copyright owners are on the one hand saying, we would like your audience to be aware of the music that we're doing. On the other hand, they're calling up the, the, the government. Or even worse, the government on its own initiative is thinking there's a problem, and the government's just grabbing the domain name, no uh, notice required, no explanation required, no consequences for doing so. So the executive branch is doing some of the things that we thought were supposed to be covered by the law. They're grabbing domain names. They're cutting off linking sites. They're cutting off web hosts, um, uh, using criminal enforcement powers to do so, the guys with the big guns. Another place where the battle is taking place is through the International Treaties and Trade Agreements. Some of you may be familiar with the term ACTA, which stands for the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. Um, we've finally seen a copy of ACTA. I read it, and I had no idea what it said. So I can't say that it was good or bad, because I didn't understand it. So I'm agnostic for now about the substantive uh, components of ACTA, um, though I uh, don't really understand why we're doing it. But the procedure of ACTA is incredibly troubling because ACTA is designed to be a, a trade agreement where everyone agrees we're gonna fight counterfeiting. And it stayed at that level, if you define counterfeiting appropriately, that's a good thing, let's get rid of the bad guys. Um, however, um, it takes place behind closed doors. I'm sorry, the negotiations take place behind closed doors. So you have all these discussions about ACTA that are taking place where you have the government representatives and whoever they decide it should be invited. Well, they generally don't invite the public to be at those conversations. They invite the people who are regular players, the industry representatives, the copyright owners are at the table. The copyright are saying, you know, maybe we could put some burdens on some of those people in the red box on the right-hand column that we saw a few slides ago. It, we could just stuff it into ACTA. And then what we can do is once it becomes a trade agreement that everyone's agreed upon, then either you sign it or you don't. If you don't sign it, there's supposed to be international stigma associated with it. And if you sign it, then what? Has it become binding law in the United States? By, because there was this, this, this law that, or this, this agreement that was negotiated outside of the public view, not by our appointed members of Congress, um, but by some representatives of the executive branch um, who we as the voters have very loose control over. 
Our executive branch, member of the revolving door, has taken the position that ACTA does not require congressional approval, that the president can just sign it. So our elected representatives, other than the president and, uh, and by proxy his people, are, are being told you never get a chance to approve this. But yet it will still be binding on us as American, uh, as America because we've signed into that agreement. Well, that's not really all that healthy, is it? That doesn't sound like a very good way to make the law. But it's certainly a great way for copyright owners to inject into the American legal discussion what they were trying to get that they couldn't get from Congress. Remember, they went to Congress. Congress said no. So why not go to the, people, to, to the place where Congress won't even get a chance to touch it? Get the same damn thing. ACTA is troubling. Even more troubling is another agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We have not seen this agreement. It has been taking place completely behind closed doors. To the extent that anyone from the public has tried to inject themselves into the process, they have been shut down. There was a, a meeting taking place where the, uh, some advocates were actually going to uh, try and have a meeting at that hotel, at the same hotel. They were kicked out of the hotel. Get out. Nobody who's involved in the process wants us to know what's in that agreement. I can't tell you if it's objectionable or not. I haven't seen it, nor have you. However, um, we do know that the copyright owners are at the table. What do you think they're doing? They're saying, give us what we couldn't get from Congress. Let's get an agreement in place. Let's go get the executive branch to sign it. We bypass Congress. We get to the same place. Another battle that's taking place is in the courts. Um, and in the courts, um, we're seeing all kinds of litigation. Um, so, for example, um, something that's not on the screen here is um, the, uh, an e-textbook publisher has, uh, 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 was upset with a linking site. Okay, remember the linking sites are linking to other people's files they are somewhere else. Um, and so uh, the e-textbook publisher was trying to shut down this linking site was, that was linking to one of its electronic textbooks. Um, and so in addition to suing the actual person who was um, uh, running the site, they sued that person's ad network. The ad network had made about $500 from this um, uh, person. We know that what the incentives are at that point. They're not going to stand behind that user. Um, and the court said, copyright owner, you, don't get, uh, uh, you, you, you lose against the ad network. But that's only because you didn't send a takedown notice. Now, by inference, if the copyright owner, instead of suing first, had sent a takedown notice to the ad network, this court, by inference, might have said that the ad network was obligated to cut off the, uh, the uh, linking site uh, that was linking to this uh, infringing uh, e-textbook. Um, so the copyright owners are seeking the same kind of things in court that they were looking for in the statute. They're just um, uh, having to navigate around uh, building that common law. But what we're really seeing here, and what I find most interesting, is the situations that are depicted by some of these lawsuits here. You can see we found five of them. I'm sure there are hundreds more of these. Now, these are principally trademark cases, not copyright cases, but the, the exact model works the same. Here's how it goes. Assume for a moment that there's a rogue site that the copyright owner or trademark owner doesn't like, and it's foreign. What they do is that they sue the site here in the United States, and then they give notice to the site. That. Now, again, this is a foreign site. How you give notice across borders is sometimes very tricky. We don't really believe that the site owners actually get notice in any legally meaningful way with any due process. We just assume that they don't actually know that this litigation is taking place. So the IP owner goes into court. They give notice to the foreign site. Foreign site no-shows. At this point now, we are proceeding ex parte in practice. One side only is in front of the judge. And then what these people are uh, doing is they're saying, give me orders that apply to all the people in the red box, that tell the payment system providers to stop moving money to these sites, or tell the uh, domain name uh, registrars to give over the domain name. In other words, all the things that we thought we were fighting about in SOPA or PIPA is being ordered by judges on an ex parte, one side only present basis in court against these foreign sites because they are no showing in court. So um, let me give you an example. Um, there was a, one, this one, the uh, Philip Morris case involved a Chinese uh, seller of uh, counterfeit cigarettes. I'm not a smoker. Smoking counterfeit cigarettes strikes me as something I probably would choose not to do, even if I were. Um, nevertheless, um, what the court ordered was it told Western Union to interdict any money that was being sent to this Chinese counterfeit retailer. 
Let me tell you, let me see what this means. So on an ex party basis, the court ordered Western Union to take the buyer's money and just hold on to it, put it to the side. Now, some of these buyers might be thinking, I'm just going to get something that I don't deserve. Some of these buyers might not have realized that they were buying counterfeit goods. And these buyers were having their money taken and just held on to. They weren't getting the cigarettes. They weren't getting their money back. They may not even be getting notice. The money was just going to the side. Now, the buyers were there to defend their interests in court. The judge didn't hear from them. The seller wasn't there to defend their interests in courts. They got notice and no showed. So the court and Western Union is not in court either, right? They haven't even been sued. This order is being given against them. They've never been a defendant. So what we're getting is exactly what we thought we weren't going to get from SOPA. We're getting the payment system provider to cut off the flow of money in a way that not only cuts off the recipient of the money, in this case it holds on to the senders of the money and they get nothing. The money just goes into a black hole. Okay. Um, and the last diagram I'm going to mention is the, quote, voluntary initiatives. So these are the initiatives that are taking place outside of the courts, outside of the legislature, and yet voluntarily people are uh, deciding to do so. Um, one example is the graduated response system. Uh, it's being run by this uh, site called Center for Covered Information. I would think Franklin Pierce would be a better place for covered information than a Center for Covered Information. But notice that this is not a neutral source of um, uh, of information about copyright. Um, let's talk about the content theft challenge or how content theft uh, uh, costs America. This is a advocacy site. And this is being run by the people who are going to operate a graduated re response system. Here's how it works. Internet access providers have voluntarily agreed that they will accept automated notices from, uh, that are technology created um, that will identify people on their networks who are engaged in peer-to-peer um, -peer file sharing uh, uh, downloading um, uh, Ill uh, illicitly. And uh, if a person gets enough notices, the internet access provider has agreed to take action against that person. We don't know what action. The most logical action is they will literally terminate that person's internet access. But if they don't, they will minimum suspend it or otherwise constrain it. Um, and so the internet access providers have agreed to be the copyright deputies for the copyright owners, they're going to be going and adverse to their customers. The ones who are paying them, they're going to be restricting those cost, the services provided to those customers because the copyright owners have asked them to do so. 17 U.S.C. 512A, passed in 1998, I think makes it explicitly clear that internet access providers are not liable for copyright infringement that's done by their users. Not direct, not contributory, not vicarious, not at all. So this is, in that sense, truly voluntary. But is it really that voluntary? Um, why would they agree to it uh, when they are, A, going to be doing the will of the copyright owners, and B, losing money from their own subscribers by doing so? Furthermore, the, cover, the subscribers can defend their interests against this, but only if they fit into pre-selected defenses. So for example, you can defend saying that that automated uh, uh, notice that was uh, filed against me, one of my strikes, was actually wrong because the material was in the public domain. But in the, the system that's being set up by this graduated response system, you can only do that if it fell into the public domain because it was um, uh, from before 1923. If it fell into the public domain any other way, you can't object to the notice in that way. Right? So it's like a kangaroo court. This is not a place that you can actually debate copyright. You can only debate it if you fit within their pre-selected buckets. Um, and uh, so this is from the uh, ICANN blog. Uh, do you know anything about this? Yes. <laughs> so, so do we have that person in the room? No. Okay, good. Um, so uh, here we have a thought paper that gives guidance for anyone who prepares an order that seeks to take to seize or take down domain names. Is to help preparers of those actions understand what information we need in order to do what you ask. This is a document that says, here's how we will disable domain names. You just have to ask. So we're back to the whole thing that we thought we were fighting with Soba and Pippa. We didn't think the domain name operators were going to be disabling domain names under legal compulsion. And here they're saying, we'd love to do it for you. Here's the recipe. Please follow this, and we'll be happy to effectuate your goals. OK, I'm almost done talking. I just have a wrap up about the future. Let me see if I've made my case to you. Let's talk about January 18th. January 18th, we had consumers who love the internet, who got the message through the different marketing that the future of the internet was at stake. 
and they were up against incumbent monopolists. And normally in that battle, consumers get railroaded, but this time the consumers won, and it's a reminder that your vote does matter. You as a voter can tell your uh, representatives what you want from them. And if enough of us speak out, they will listen. And if enough of us change our vote when we go into the ballot box, we can make a difference. There is still a Republican government here in this country. You have the power to do that. We saw that on January 18th when 19 senators took a position because of the outcry. January 18th was a win. Post January 18th, we are fighting asymmetry of a significant import. Back to the consumers who love the internet versus incumbent monopolists. The incumbent monopolists are going to find other battlegrounds besides Congress or backdoor ways into Congress, and they're gonna fight on every single one of those battlegrounds. And the consumers who love the internet, if you feel like what they were asking for on January 18th was wrong, you have to win each and every battle in order to defeat the overall objective. You have to win in Congress. You have to win in the executive branch. You have to win in the international trade agreements. You have to win in court. And you have to win in uh, the voluntary initiatives. You lose any one of those battles and the copyright owners win. So in other words, this is like military defense. As you may know, in military defense, you have to be strong across your entire border. The attacker only has to pick one weak point and then they can pour right through the defenses. And that's exactly what's going on today. We're seeing that the copyright owners are looking for all the different battlefronts and they only have to win one to get what they were, where they were trying to go. And so my position is that if we really think that what was in SOPA and PIPA was a bad idea, there's only one way to get there. And that is to actually create new immunities and safe harbors that will encourage those people in the red box on my slide to not go and act as the content owner's copyright police. Um, this is politically unrealistic. I am aware of that. But my challenge to you is if we don't do this, the outcome is already faded. And with that, let me turn it over to your comments and questions. Yes, sir. I had a question about uh, the recent ruling in YouTube versus Viacom. And if you saw that that would sort of be ammunition to fund or ammunition in the voluntary model, since that was a major setback for Google and sort of undermined their safe, safe harbors provision. So uh, last week, uh, the Second Circuit um, uh, held that uh, YouTube may not qualify for uh, the 512C safe harbors. Remember, these were the ones that were enacted in 1998, saying that so long as they get noticed and take it down expeditiously, they're not responsible for user content. The Second Circuit ruling had didn't say YouTube will lose. And it's actually my belief that YouTube is either going to win the case entirely, or if it loses, it will lose only over a very small number of clips. So in practice, YouTube is likely to win or substantially mitigate that case um, uh, despite the ruling. However, the ruling has some sloppy language in it, some areas that will allow plaintiffs to start to look for ways to hold um, the web host more accountable in situations where the content, the copyright owners didn't send takedown notices and have the um, uh, the websites respond expeditiously. So, to the extent that the case um, changes the environment, it creates the possibility that we might have lawsuits where the notice and takedown regime wasn't followed, and yet the website might still be liable. I don't know that will be the practice. This case came on the heels of a Ninth Circuit case in late uh, 2011, where the Ninth Circuit basically said notice and takedown or nothing, and so from my perspective, it's um, going to be a little unclear what's going to happen uh, with plaintiffs start to challenge this. I think what's most likely to happen is that um, uh, plaintiffs will challenge. The courts will say, did you send a notice? And did they uh, fail to take it down? Co uh, copyright owners are going to say, no, I didn't send a notice. Or yes, they did take it down. And the courts are going to say, sorry, I got nothing for it. I think in the end, we're going to get there. But we're going to have a few more years of uncertainty. And we're going to have. Um, uh, a bunch more uh, uh, money spent on litigation. My point is, and I, I, I can't stress this enough, that the content owners don't have to do the notice and takedown to the website in order to get the results they want. They send the notices and the takedown to all the people that were on the right here, in the, in the red box. And so what we're going to see is, to the extent that they don't get the ability to go after these people directly, they just put the pressure up here. And so, in that sense, it might be a, a short-term win and a long-term loss. It will just double down the efforts of the copyright owners. If they can't get at the front door, they go in the back door. Questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, to what degree they can put 
pressure on them in a sense that they are shutting off their clients. So in the system that you discussed, that you, you know, the binary system which they are either on or off, they are ultimately killing themselves because they are shutting off their clients. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so I'll take a payment system, uh, uh, for example. Imagine that you've got a customer who's generating a million dollars a month for you um, as the payment system, right? That's your take. Well, you're probably going to be very cautious with respect to that. But notice those are going to be built up players. So what's going to happen is new startup comes out and it's trying to get traction. And the content owners will target those new startups before they get to be large enough that the people in the red box care about the money that they're generating. And so we saw this, for example, with Veo, a YouTube competitor, that um, in the case of Veo, um, uh, Veo, uh, after many years of litigation, the Ninth Circuit, this was the case I mentioned late uh, 2011, said Veo fully qualifies for the 512C safe harbor. They did everything that, that Congress wanted them to do circa 1998. But VO had already shut down because it had been bled dry by the litigation. So the point was, VO never got to the point where it got large enough to be able to afford all the costs in the system. So VO starts out, they hook up with an ad network. They're not YouTube. YouTube's ad network business you'd care about. VO's ad network, they have no traction. You send a takedown notice to VO, they never grow big enough. Let me give you another example of a site that would have, I believe, never gotten anywhere under a SOPA regime. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not a user of it, but Pinterest. You guys are familiar with Pinterest? Some of you may have seen Pinterest, right? Uh, I don't know even how to describe it. It's, it's a site that's not for me. Um, can someone describe Pinterest in one sentence? What do you, what do you, hope you pin pictures. You take pictures from other websites and pin them to your digital wall. So you create an ongoing stream of things that you pinned that are photos of other people, right? Uh, well, not necessarily. Uh, 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 other people's photos. It, I'm sorry. It could be your own. Okay. Um, for a while, actually, they were restricted. They were saying it has to be someone else's, not your own. But I think they've liberalized that since then. Um, Pinterest is is a very visual website. It's got, I believe, five columns, and I'm a and most a two column guy. You saw I got up to three columns here. I was pretty impressed with myself. Five, too many. But Pinterest is all about sharing other people's photos. Their entire engine is about sharing other people's copyrighted works. Pinterest has 15 employees. Pinterest, fastest growing website of all time, but they have 15 employees. They don't have the money to make it so that they're worth the time of any of these people to stand up for them. They're a small pl potatoes player. And all, any one of the copyright owners who are upset that Pinterest is allowing users to pin those photos, any one of them can go to these players and say, cut them off. And those players might say, you know what, not worth it to me, out they go. Fastest growing website of all time might never come to existence under a SOPA world. Yeah? The fastest growing website of all time, then how can you say that they don't have a financial stake in doing this? I mean, you know, I thought that the language in the last slide you had up there, the incumbent monopolist fails to acknowledge the $23.2 billion <coughs> Google AdWorks makes every year. So who is in fact the incumbent? I actually think that's about 30 million, uh, 30 billion. So uh, they make a lot. Yeah. So who is the incumbent monopolist in the room? Well, okay, fair enough. Um, it's a little hard to reverse engineer the way in which those billions of dollars are generated and how it ties to copyright infringing activity or trademark infringing activity. Yeah, so. You have to admit it's in Google's interest to try to continue to allow the infringement because it does play into part of that revenue. Um, Right. Uh, in fact, that's true for every um, uh, publisher um, who allows uh, um, infringing activity to take place. Uh, more activity, more money that they make, one way or another. Whatever their monetization scheme is, um, they're always, that, that's true for everyone, not just Google. Any site that is in the business of having user generated content, they make more money the more activity users do. They're agnostic about infringing or uninfringing activity. So. D let's not single out Google for that. Let's single out the entire user generated content ecosystem and say all of them have that same incentive. Now, Google does stand alone because they are a, a, uh, a dominant player in the search engine business. Now, we're talking about different businesses here. Um, and uh, and when, to recognize uh, when I, what I meant by the incumbent monopolist, um, 
Uh, it's a little bit of a cheat. I understand that. Um, copyright creates quasi-monopolies, right? Uh, they create the power to exclude anyone from enjoying the same assets that the copyright owner has. Um, and from economic theory, monopolists get economic rents. And so what the copyright owners do is they take those economic rents, they're created by the government from a government regulatory scheme called copyright law, and they plow that money back into the system in order to expand and extend those rights. Basics, uh, economic behavior for monopolists. Now Google's monopoly position, if you want to call it that, I call him a dominant player, but we, could, we don't have to quibble on the word, um, doesn't come from the largesse of the government that way. In other words, it comes from uh, them having uh, bested their competitors. So the, the starting point is different, and what we're seeing in, what we saw in SOPA and PIPA was actually what we would call, in economic terms, just classic rent seeking. It was the people who were taking all these profits that were manufactured by a government right, and they were plowing it back into the government in order to extend those rights. So that's what I meant, and I apologize if, I, if that point wasn't as clear in the slide. I don't think I responded to your concern, so, so keep going, please. I'm just curious then, so what model do you envision as the, in other words, how does one pay to create content? Okay, um, so, <clears throat> Uh, I think I can answer in about five seconds, right? That's a nice, light topic. How do we uh, uh, create a, a payment mechanism that uh, uh, funds the production of socially valuable uh, works um, uh, that um, uh, might be eligible for what we call copyright? Um, copyright is only one tool that we have to uh, uh, encourage socially productive activity, and so we should not ignore the fact that there are many different models that we could use. We cover, I don't know if you cover this in your IP survey class. I actually spend a little time in IP survey class. You taught this in your IP theory class. You know, we don't have to have copyright. That's just one choice of about a half dozen different regulatory models that we use um, in order to uh, get people to produce socially valuable works. Um, but within the, the scheme of copyright, um, one of the biggest challenges that we have here um, is that because the copyright owners were so convinced that they were just going to win the next uh, 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 battle, they didn't actually tell us in any scientifically rigorous way how, the, um, uh, how uh, the problems they were trying to fix were actually costing them money that they needed in order to do the things that they're currently doing today. In other words, there was this thing, uh, content theft is a problem. Remember, we got the whole slides here. Uh, where was it? Um, uh, content theft uh, uh, hurts the economy. Uh, content theft, uh, here you can't see it totally, it says more than 30 th 373,000 jobs are dependent upon uh, these copyright activities. They, they tell a story, but we don't fully understand that story. And so um, from my standpoint, I'd like to understand what's not going right and then try and figure out why it's not going right in a way that would answer that we're not getting people to do what we want them to do that's part of the general quid pro quo copyright law. In other words, I don't understand yet that the, the quid pro quo has actually broken down in a way that's causing uh, us to lose activity that we want in practice. That's a story that could be told. I'm not convinced that I've seen it told yet. And the con content owners who went to Congress didn't feel like they need to tell that story. They could simply go in and say, there's these bad guys, we need to blast them, give us these powers. They thought that was all they needed to say. So we might still get an answer to your question when the copyright owners tell us what activity they are foreclosing because of the activity that's taking place that they would like to shut down. Have you read the GE uh, annual reports? Have you read ABC Disney's annual reports? Have you looked at the 20 plus percent yearly decline in revenue income that's attributable to ad sales moving online? That's the story. In, 10 seconds or less. Well, okay, uh, I, I will confess, I apologize, I'm ill prepared for this talk. I have not read all those annual reports. Um, however, um, uh, there's a lot of moving parts to our content ecosystem and the financial support for it. Um, so there's uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the situations where we as consumers pay content owners directly for the work that they do. Uh, and then there's ways that we pay them indirectly through things like advertising. And then there's ways that we pay them even more indirectly because they give us uh, rivalrous, uh, uh, non-rivalrous goods, uh, things that are freely shareable, with the idea that that's going to lead to a transaction in other rivalrous goods, some kind of cross-subsidization or cross-selling uh, that might be taking place. Um, and so um, it's hard for us to reverse engineer and disaggregate all that in, as you said, the 10-second story. 
Um, so I think um, I'd be happy to explore this more with you um, in a one-to-one -one conversation, but I will put on the table, these are really important questions that you're asking, really questions that we need to get our handle on. But until we get, uh, I think, the right uh, evidence in here, we're likely not to hit the nail on the head. And I'm sorry, I'm going to say one more thing about that. The paradigmatic target for SOPA and PIPA, the one site that the content owner said is the, the flagship example of illicit activity is the pirate bay that's uh, uh, from Europe. And the way the laws were drafted, the pirate bay would have been unaffected. So if the pirate bay is a problem that's costing content owners money, we should make sure we fix that problem. The law that was proposed did not fix the flagship example of the problem that we thought we were addressing. To me, that is all I need to know, that we don't have the right solution yet, and we don't understand the problem well enough. Please, go ahead. I just want to, to kind of shift to mega upload. Do um, you think the takings argument for the uh, innocent users is going to be effective? That the government took their property without notice to them? So um, the, the government's uh, handling the mega upload. I'm sorry. I, I, you already told I'm, I'm not censored here. But I, I think it was disgusting. The government thought of mega upload as just uh, engaged in uh, uh, wholesale copyright infringement didn't think of mega upload as it should have as a publisher of content. And they seized the printing press of a content publisher. And to me, the fact that they didn't tread more cautiously there is disgusting. That's exactly what we don't want our government to do, but we've already seen plenty of examples where our government has gone rogue against us as, in our visions of a, of a democracy. Um, so uh, how we're gonna remediate that is unclear. The government is still insisting that users are not entitled to the data that they have stored on mega upload servers. Um, so it, it, in order to get there, you would have to argue things like data, I electronic data is property. I've always felt uncomfortable with an argument like that. I really don't want to go there for other reasons. But the fact that our government is actively trying to suppress that information, in fact, is begging the person who currently uh, has the information to delete it permanently, to eliminate the forensic evidence that might inculcate, or, uh, uh, inculcate, help me. Uh, inculcate, in, uh, or exculcate um, uh, the defendant here, right? It could go either way. The government's saying, we don't want to know. Let's get rid of the data altogether. Is shocking to me. Not only are they hurting the criminal prosecution, they are also hurting all the innocent users whose data was affected by that. And the government has shown zero interest in that. Unbelievable. I don't know how we're going to fix that. My, what I don't understand, I'm not techie, is why it costs so much money to continue storing that data. I would think you just get a very large flash drive and dump it all on the flash drive. Um, but apparently that's not how it works. And so um, uh, someone's bearing a lot of money to keep that data active. And that's why there's, uh, uh, we might not see it. Otherwise, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. I also have a question, sort of, what, what options do you see for American intellectual property owners, or US intellectual property owners when, when, say, it is a Hong Kong site that is infringing their content, do you think that they should have recourse here in the U.S. or only in Hong Kong where the content's being shared or infringed? Yeah, and Professor Wong is probably more of an expert in this than I am about the way you do transporter enforcement. It's, uh, I confess, an area that I find a confusing one. Um, and uh, so um, I'm interested in both possible solutions. But if we're going to have procedures here in the U.S., they have to be rigorous enough that we know that there's not just railroading going on. And the cases I uh, flagged for you here, these examples, I can say with confidence that it's a, it's a railroad job. Um, so if they're going to be here in the US, we have to have better systems to make sure that the judges understand that if the defendant no-shows, that they can't just throw the defendant under the bus. They have to actually go through and think very carefully, not only about what obligations they have to the defendant, but anyone else that they're going to try and put into an order that's being conducted on an ex-party basis. Um, so I'm agnostic about that. There was a competitive legislation proposed called OPEN that was designed to set up an expedited resolution process in ITC that would solve some of the problems, allow the uh, U.S. activity or U.S. Uh, uh, judicial system to supervise the activity or adjudicate the, the decisions um, for foreign activity. I, I wasn't a huge fan of that, but I thought that that might be a better way of trying to balance the interests, create something that's expedited, but make sure there's enough due process in the system that we don't make mistakes. Remember, when we make mistakes, we're making mistakes not just about the infringing activity, we're making mistakes about the non-infringing activity as well. That's what Mega Upload showed us. There were a lot of innocent people who got affected by that. I saw more hands over here. Yeah. Yeah, 
I just wanted to ask, with the convergence of cable and the internet, with things like Xfinity and Hulu, how much does the regulatory regime with like cable television, how is that going to affect that? And, and going back to the how people make money situation, if there's this regulatory regime that's basically keeping people from making potentially rational business decisions, how much could that be affecting um, the copyright owners? Uh, could you unpack your question a little more? Because I'm not sure I have a paradigmatic example that you're thinking about. Well, I I'm just thinking moving forward with, I I'm not thinking of a potentially infringing site like YouTube or um, Mega Upload or something. I'm thinking of the regimes like Hulu or like Xfinity is Comcast. I don't know if you're familiar on how their reach is. Um, but those situations where the SEC handles a lot of the cable institutions and we've got things over the internet are have different restrictions and regulations than the stuff that's coming up as cable, as television. And with the content discussion, you know, with, with video content, that seems like um, the, the, the situation there seems like it could play a big role in, in the actual money that you know, institutions like Sony or Universal are actually getting. I, I think you may have a pretty complicated question there. Let me just contextualize and tell you where we'll stop the conversation. Um, you have a situation where you have some big giants going at each other over economic spoils. Um, and those big giants um, are both, you know, you have uh, a, you know, a good uh, back and forth between them. They're able to both look out for their interests pretty aggressively. Um, we as users are not at the table. So when we see, you know, a stupid FCC ruling, it's because the big giants either won one and one lost and nobody cared about us, or because they colluded, they agreed, they went to the government, and the government's like, well, everyone seems to be happy, we as users got, got uh, thrown under the box. Um, but I think that's a, a very different situation than the user-generated content ecosystem. And that's really, I think, what's at stake in the legislation that's been proposed. There's all the other activity. I want to say it's kind of business as usual. Users never have been really at the table in those circumstances, and they're not likely to be anytime soon. But I don't see that as any different, and I don't know then that there's a lot new that we can talk about um, where the dynamics really change in a material way. Uh, other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, we'll take this to the last one. Okay. Um, oh, this might be off base, but one of the things that I've, I've realized here is that, at least from the first few slides and kind of the previous conversations, is that we've done um, some of these things make sense, right, to us as law students and everything. But I think what doesn't make sense to me is the fact that it's so politicized. And then on top of that, we've done a terrible job um, convincing the public about what this is about. Um, I mean, if Kim Kardashian says that this is bad, I, I would believe it, right? If, if we're in the public domain. 14 million users follow her. Right. I want you to think about that for a moment. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, I, have, I have a couple thousand. But I'm not sure I'm more poor than Kim Kardashian, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm less. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, please go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, we're so fixated on wanting to tinker with everything. We want to make new safe harbors. We want to make new laws. We're worried about these securities things. I'm just wondering how could we possibly do nothing? Do we actually have to make something new? Are, are we convinced this is terrible? And then on top of that, could, couldn't we attack something like this through like education? Okay, let me break this question up for a moment. Let's talk about the education piece for a moment. Education is an, obviously a key component. As you may know, the copyright owners, again, and part of their squeezing the bottle and they'll, they'll fight somewhere else, they've been very successful at getting um, uh, airtime and uh, public education, right? That uh, as part of you becoming a young adult nowadays, you're going to have education about copyright law. Um, I think ultimately that may be a good thing. It's certainly different from when I was in school. Um, and it depends on who's writing the script. If the script is uh, don't engage in content theft, that's a very different thing than be careful. You might, uh, you, might have, uh, uh, you might be infringing or you might be eligible for fair use. You really need to think carefully. Two very different scripts. Um, but I want to go back to this. I mean, this is a perfect note for us to end on. What about the option just do nothing, right? Now, remember, if you go back and look at all the laws that have been proposed in copyright over the last, since the 1976 Act, but you could really go back further, almost none of them have come from user communities. 
None of them have been when we, as the people, have gone to our Congress and said, Congress, you need to help us. They all come, almost all, virtually all, come from copyright owners. So we as individuals don't have the choice, just do nothing, because we're not controlling that agenda. The copyright owners come to Congress once every year or two and say, here's my wish list. Congress says, how much are you going to pay in my campaign contributions? They say, we'll pay enough. How much is it going to take? And that's why we have to deal with something. So what's weird is, I, I have a blog post I still need to write, where it's going to start and say, somewhere in a back room, some entertainment uh, strategist is cackling, saying, these guys shut down the internet, and all they did was preserve the status quo. The do-nothing option isn't going to happen, whether that's the right policy outcome or not because the content owners have it in their interest to go fight the battles at the weakest point. So if that's the goal you want, you have to defeat them. Don't want to talk about proposing you. You have to defeat them in each and every battle. And that's an expensive process that I think it'll be impossible for the users to win. And with that, let me say thank you very much for your time and attention. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Eric. And um, once. We very rarely have a wrapped room where no one is coughing, shuffling, or leaving, um, except for more than 30 seconds. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I will say for those of you in the copyright class tomorrow, I think Eric's already done half your homework since we're talking about some of these issues. And I will also like to add that since you brought up ICANN a little bit, um, it, it's interesting that a lot of the break the internet stuff has been stripped from some of the bills, not necessarily because ICANN did something about it. What was interesting is that the current president or chair of the board of ICANN, Steve Crocker, is somebody who wrote some of the very early RFCs for the internet, and he wrote with some other influential people a very influential paper about how SOPA and PIPA would break the internet, and he was in conversations with, um, I know, with some of the government people. But ICANN in public, and for those of you who don't know, I volunteer at ICANN, have done so for a few years. In all the last few ICANN meetings I've been to, we have never had a public session on SOPA, PIPA, or any of these issues. What I will tell you, though, from my few years of involvement, and Eric knows this, is the point he makes about squeezing the bottle and the fight, the same fight and the same issues and the same request, moving somewhere else, the forum shifting, is very, very true. And the point that he also makes, the relentlessness of rights holders, many of whom are my former clients and my current friends, so it's not a diatribe on my part. That's just what they do. The revolving door adds to that. Um, Eric and I had a brief discussion about ICANN. It is, to my mind, a worthy experiment in internet governance. And I think what we're starting to see with the January 18th is that the users, the community, the internet itself is mobilizing. My fear is that, as he said, you have to fight every battle, on every battleground, and that's just very, very difficult. So I would encourage you all to continue to take an interest in the issue, and once more, join me, please, in thanking our special guest today, Professor Eric Goldman. Thank you.